Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Self-Head Fixation Training for the Study of Perceptual Decisions in Mice. This webinar has been sponsored by Amusa, so a big thank you to them for helping to make this event possible. Joining us today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Andrea Benucci from Riken Center for Brain Science in Japan. His presentation will discuss a setup developed in his laboratory for high throughput behavioral training of mice based on voluntary head fixation. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Andrea Benucci. Uh, Andrea, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. All right, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I will talk about uh, self-head fixation training for the study of perceptual decisions in mice. Um, this work is linked to a setup that we developed across 2014 and 17, I would say, and um, has been described in a, in a method paper uh, in Nature Communications in 2017. Today, I will not talk a lot about the things that you can find in the paper, but rather focus on details that, uh, in the interest of space, we cannot put in the paper, but I think are very important if you want to operate uh, this setup successfully. So let me start with the motivations um, at that time. Um, we um, we decided to um, embark in this very challenging project because um, we, we knew that the mouse is a very convenient model organism uh, in view of the unmatched set of experimental toolboxes that are available to study brain functions and multiple levels of analysis. Here I'm referring to ontogenetics, chemogenetics, uh, if his methodologies as well, intersectional methods. Um, so depending on your research interests, you might be facing one of the following experimental requirements. You might need to train mice in a, in a very complex task, but you don't need very many animals. You just need a few of them, let's say around 10 animals. So this could be um, a situation that you might face if, for example, you're interested in a task that has been demonstrated in primates, and uh, you're wondering whether you can train rodents, uh, specifically mice, uh, in such a task. Uh, and you, you also know that just uh, like a copy and paste of the training procedure from primates to mice is not going to work. Uh, so you, you're, you're faced with a challenge to explore uh, a rich, a very large parameter space uh, in, in terms of um, training parameters that might require uh, weeks or months of work and the involvement of a lot of people. Uh, and it might not even succeed in the end. So this is one, one possible scenario that you might be facing in your lab, uh, and we definitely did face in our, in our lab. Another uh, situation that you might be uh, encountering is that you, you want to train mice in a relatively, relatively simple task, uh, but you need a lot of animals, let's say in, in the order of hundreds, and, and quickly. So this could be, for example, if you're involved in some sort of um, translational or medical related research. You want a task that is uh, easy to execute, uh, that has been demonstrated before. Um, and you, you, wanna, you wanna have a lot of animals, you wanna have a big N. So um, this, these two scenarios together, whether you're um, dealing with a complex task, a few animals, but you need to explore a large parameter space or a simple task with many animals, they both imply high throughput technology. There are then a number of requirements that we wanted from, from our setup. Um, we wanted um, the setup to be easy to modify. So imagine that you, you have started with an associative task uh, with an auditory stimulus, but suddenly you need to start working on uh, visual motor, uh, sorry, a visual auditory integration. So in, in, that, in that case, um, you, you need to introduce a visual stimulus, a monitor, and you don't want to spend weeks to modify your setup. You, you want it to be up and running, let's say, in a, in a couple of days. Um, another important requirement uh, is about uh, the possibility to use the setup uh, with your favorite experimental tool. So especially for mice, uh, there are a lot of experimental tools that keep on developing and, and, and changing from year to year or even month to month. So uh, if at some point you want to adopt a new methodology or um, uh, uh, integrate different methodologies with the setup, here I'm listing just a few that are available in, in mice. Uh, again, you don't want to go back to the whiteboard and, and, uh, 
and redesign from scratch your system. There's a, another consideration that it was important in, in our lab, and it might be important for you as well, is the one of head fixation. So if, if you train animals in freely moving conditions, and then you force head fixation during brain recordings, uh, then this will likely disrupt the learned behavior. And uh, it might even require a, a full retraining of the animal with head fixation. So as I will explain later on, uh, we're interested in visual perception and perception decision making. So for example, it's very important for us to know uh, what the mice are looking at, what are the stimuli that are shown to the, to the mice. And so for that head fixation, uh, can be very convenient. There are also some recording methodologies that uh, require uh, stable, uh, stable preparation in terms of uh, the position of the head. And um, if you uh, spend months uh, training freely, uh, animals in freely moving conditions and then suddenly you, you latch their head, they really don't like that. And uh, they will form a very strong aversive association with the latching system, the head fixation system. Um, and it, you will have to spend a lot of time to extinguish this association. And uh, depending on the complexity of the task, uh, these this mice would uh, probably need a complete retraining. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, a consideration that is more practical, and if you want even related to financial aspects, you want to minimize the, the human effort and involvement in the behavioral training. So ideally, you would like to have um, one person and also working part-time, not full-time. And uh, this requirement uh, implies automation. So I, I put in there a lot of uh, requirements. It is a very long wish list. and um, how do we, do we achieve all of this? I think uh, you, you can imagine what I'm going to say. <laughs> this is the setup that we developed and uh, that we presented uh, in this method paper. Um, I have to, uh, to say right away that this project uh, was possible thanks to uh, a great collaboration uh, with uh, uh, Ohara. It's, uh, it's a company, a uh, Japanese-based company. Uh, it's a team of uh, great uh, creative and very talented uh, people and we bounce back and forth a lot of ideas initially I have to say they were a little bit skeptical but then they got on board and uh, um, skeptical whether we, we could uh, teach uh, or we could create a system where mice could uh, self uh, head fixate um, but eventually uh, I think they were also very uh, positively surprised by the, the great success of this setup. And, and now this setup uh, is sold by them and to the non-Japanese customers, uh, it is sold through uh, Amundsen. So the platform uh, now has a very nice uh, look. Uh, there's still a lot of cables, but it, it has been cleaned up a lot from the initial developmental stages. And um, it has many components. So I will go fairly quickly through, through the various components and show you then also a video with the mouse entering the setup. Uh, but then, I as I mentioned before, I would like to focus on some of the details that we couldn't put in the paper, but might be important to operate the setup. So um, the setup um, is connected to two mouse cages. These are regular mouse cages um, that you can put in individually ventilated racks. Um, and um, the, the only modification that we made is that as you can see um, yeah, from this picture, in the in the front, there are these square metal openings that uh, give access uh, to the main setup. Um, so we have, um, in, in a typical uh, training session, at some point, a computer would open a door that gives access from the cage to, to the setup. And um, there are many doors uh, which are in place so that uh, the animal from the home cage can only reach the very far end of the setup, which is uh, located on the left side of this, of this uh, image. You can actually see the mouse, if you pay attention at the very, very end, uh, uh, head latch. And um, the, the doors are controlled by uh, several motor actuators. And there's a software that uh, I will explain later on that makes sure that the animal never gets trapped inside the setup and, and that a mouse is, cannot go from one cage to another. For the software to know where the animal is, we have a lot of infrared beams uh, positioned in various parts of the setups. And we also have uh, a scale 
for uh, automated uh, measurement of the weight of the animal. Uh, this is very important because um, in, uh, in most of our uh, behavioral paradigms, we use uh, we, we control the amount of water they, the animals can get per day, and so um, this can cause uh, health-related problems. And uh, the best way is to monitor uh, the weight of the animal at least twice a day to make sure they maintain a very healthy weight. And in this snapshot here, you can see also uh, another setup uh, is out of focus here uh, with the other two cages connected uh, to it. I will describe later uh, how these uh, racks and setups are put together on a daily basis. I will give you a more uh, uh, hands-on sort of explanation of how this should be done in, in a typical day. And uh, let, But let me show you how the setup works with a video. Here, you're gonna see the mouse on the left cage entering the setup after the, the door opens. It has a head post. You see this metal chamber on the head. It cannot go to the other cage because there is a door, a closed door. It can only go down the corridor. And now it, it enters the, the central part of the tube with the weight measurement, but it cannot go forward. The door is closed until we get a stable measurement of the weight. Then uh, it, pushes through those uh, pins. This is the latching part, we'll describe it uh, carefully later. But from now on, it's uh, self uh, um, head fixed and it cannot go back to the cage. Um, it will initiate the task. Uh, it, it is a visual task in this case and it's operating a toy wheel. It is a Lego wheel uh, with the front paws, uh, which is controlling in closed loop uh, a visual stimulus in a monitor that is positioned right in front. And when it's doing okay, it's getting a water reward. Then as you can, as you saw now, the computer at some point releases the pins and the animal can literally walk backward uh, into the cage. Okay, so um, before actually putting the animal into, uh, into the main setup, there is, um, a phase uh, that we call the uh, habituation phase um, that is absolutely critical for um, this success of, of this uh, uh, training system in the main platform. So this uh, habituation system um, is essentially a plexiglass tube that we put in the, in the home cage right after uh, implantations of the animal with the head, head chamber. So we implant them, we let them recover, then we put them back in, in a home cage alone these are individually housed. And, um, and we put inside the home cage this, uh, this system, this habituation system, where um, uh, for, for the mice to get water, they need to go inside the tube and they need to reach the far end of the tube in this, in this um, slide, we will be at the very right side, uh, in order to reach a water uh, spout and, and, and get um, their daily water. The, the water comes from a tank that is positioned at the very top of the of the cage. And uh, there's a, a tubing that is protected by a, a metal mesh so that animals, mice cannot chew through, through it and get water uh, cheating. So the only way for them to get the water is to enter the tube, go to the very far end and um, leak from the spout. But in order to go to the very far end, they need to restrain uh, their head plate. So here I'm highlighting with this, let me toggle, you see these this red lines, these narrowing railings, uh, such that um, as the animal moves uh, toward the water spouts, the, the head plate will start to get uh, progressively more and more uh, restrained. But very importantly, it will not be latched. So if, if the animal wanna go back, it can definitely do so. As, uh, there, there's no mechanism uh, to fix the um, head plate in, in, in any position. There's only a um, sort of um, uh, sort of diminished uh, sort of degrees of freedom in terms of head movements as the animal moves through these narrowing railings. And, um, and, and, and this is essentially the main goal of this habituation system. Um, to make the animal be familiar with this uh, restraining of the haplate without a block, just the restraining in order to get a water reward. So start to make an association between head plate, head plate being restrained and um, reaching a water spout and get water reward. 
So here I was highlighting with a marker uh, a, a metal mesh that we have to put um, so that the animal cannot chew through the cable, through the tube. So before the, the chamber implantation, we keep, we keep animals with litter mates in, a, in rich environments. Then we implant the animals uh, when they're about uh, one month old. And, and then we put the habituation system into the cage. Uh, in theory, you could have more than one animal uh, in, into the same cage with the habituation system. We just use one. And then you need to habitu habituate the, the animals to get their um, haploid restrained so that they can get water reward for about a week, I would say. I mean, some animals might take a little bit longer. Uh, you shouldn't rush this space. Um, it, it only requires that you periodically refill the water tank at the very bottom, uh, sorry, at the very top uh, of the metal of the cage. And uh, some animals uh, would would not be very comfortable with this system. They usually like to go inside um, these, uh, these tubes. They, they like tubes. Um, but they don't like to get their head restrained. So it, it depends on the animal. I would say in, in our experience, about a week is, is as long as it takes. It's very exceptional that it would take two weeks. And uh, it, it is very important that they uh, become so familiar with this habituation system that they go in and out without any kind of hesitation. And as I mentioned before, it is very important that you keep on monitoring the weight and you, you, get a, you give some, um, some, some gel if they they avoid the setup. Uh, in, again, in our experience, uh, the habituation phase, so getting animals uh, to become uh, comfortable with this, uh, with this tube and, and the head restraining uh, is really not a problem at all. And uh, you just have to be patient. And after about a week, you, you will see that your animals go in and out without, without any problem. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, we use water reward. So in, in our in our tasks, so we we um, control the amount of water that animals can get. But in your uh, in your experimental protocol, you might use uh, uh, food reward. So uh, this would require a, a modification of this habituation system. For example, you can put a dispenser box for food pellets, and I think this would actually be an easier solution than the one that we're using, which requires the water tank at, at the at the top of the cage and the metal mesh. Here, you would just have to design a neat uh, dispenser box so that animals cannot take all food and, and bring it uh, uh, outside the, the tube. Um, but uh, in, in theory, um, it, it will make it even more compact and uh, uh, easy to implement, I think, if you use uh, a, food, uh, a food dispenser. OK, so then uh, finally, after the habituation stage, you're ready uh, to um, attach the main setup uh, to the to the home cage of the animal and uh, give access uh, to the animal to uh, to the to the main setup now the first time it, it is very tempting to just stare uh, look at the animal uh, moving inside the tubes and going back into the cage and you want to just cheer and say come on just go forward a little bit more you're gonna make it you're so close to the spout uh, look at the water um, but this is just going to freak out the animal. So uh, the best way uh, for the first times is actually to to be very far from uh, from the setup. Um, best if you can just use a webcam and be in a different room and just observe the animal. And don't push this phase. I mean, uh, uh, the animal should feel com completely uh, comfortable to do whatever it wants. And um, even if it's going to take two hours, so be it. Don't, don't rush, don't rush this. The, the, the initial sessions are very, very important. So just be patient at the very beginning. Uh, so the way the, the latching works, so the, the, the end part of these tubes are, is very important, is where the latching unit is. And now we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this latching mechanism. It's, it's described here uh, in these uh, four panels for the latching part, and then the fifth panel is for the unlatching. And um, the basic idea is very simple. Uh, uh, as the uh, animal moves forward, the forward movement of the head plate through these narrowing railings uh, translates uh, into an um, upward and downward movement of the latching pins here in yellow. So as you can see in panel two, uh, as the animal moves forward, because of, of a slant at the very bottom of the latching pin, um, this will cause an upward movement of the pin 
And as the animal keeps on going forward, then by gravity, the pin will go down. And the same would happen with the second pin. Uh, so after passing the second pin, um, um, then the, the head plate is completely fixed. And the degrees of freedom are very minimal. The animal cannot tilt the head, cannot move backward or forward, um, and is completely blocked. Um, after a given amount of time, uh, depending on how you design your task, then the computer uh, would use a couple of metal rods and a servo motor actuator to lift up the pins and uh, unlatch the animal, then now it's free to go back uh, to the cage. Uh, here is a, a zoom in uh, onto the uh, latching part. Um, the, the animal has a head plate. You can see on the top right uh, inset, uh, like a sort of a top view. Uh, it's not very clear, but th there's this uh, head plate with a chamber in the middle. You see the pinky part, which is uh, actually optical access to the to the cortex of the mouse. What, what is very important is that um, th th this chamber has uh, what I call wings on the sides. Here, I circle them with an oval. Um, uh, and uh, this, these wings uh, have a, like a T-shape. And uh, the, the size and the distance between them is very important because it's what uh, essentially um, allows the head post to slide through the narrowing railings smoothly. And then when the animal uh, needs to go back, uh, also allows like the, the backward movement without um, the head plate getting stuck in, in the railings or in the tubing. So those two wings need um, to be um, you shouldn't modify those, those two wings. The distance between them and the shape should not be modified. However, uh, what is in between the wings is up to you. So in this case, we have a round uh, chamber for optical access, as I mentioned before. If you want to put an oval chamber, uh, a dual chamber is up to you. It depends on, um, on your experimental needs. You might not need um, a chamber. You might just need a post uh, and some um, minimal craniotomy if you need to just use a, a, like a neuropixel um, a probe. Uh, it really depends on you what goes in between those wing, wings, but the wings should not be modified. If you do modify the wings, you might have to modify the whole uh, geometry if you want. It's not, it's not going to be a big deal, but you will have to, to have uh, wider tubes and that can cause different kind of problems. There has been an optimization also in terms of the the, the basic dimensions of these tubes and the whole latching system. Um, so the, the latching unit here uh, is, a, uh, is a dual system, uh, is a dual latching system. So you might ask why two pins and why not just one pin uh, at the very far end for complete latching. So th that is actually what we started with. And it didn't work well, meaning that um, uh, animals would not um, it would take a very long time to be brave enough to go through this single uh, pin that would essentially uh, completely block their head post. So we thought that uh, if we introduce um, this after the habituation unit was put in the home cage, if we if we if we put a previous like a pin a little bit uh, farther away from the full uh, uh, blocking zone, if you want. Um, then the animals will still have some degrees of freedom in terms of movements of the head plate. So they could still tilt a little bit the head, not very much, but a little bit. And they could still uh, move a little bit uh, back and forth, not backward, sorry, uh, only forward. Uh, but it will still be, um, uh, it, it will still grant some degrees of freedom to avoid a sort of a, a panic state in the animal. And indeed, um, it, it worked. Um, animals would not like. Uh, to pass the, the first pin, the one on the left here. Um, but uh, they would do it and they would not panic. They might spend a lot of time in between the two pins, uh, but eventually, since they cannot go backward, uh, they would push forward and reach the spout and get the water. And when they do so, uh, especially the very first session, first or second session, uh, it is important that you reward the animal with a bottle of water uh, so you, you, as, as soon as they pass the second pin, um, you, you should give them a generous amount of waters. And, and, and the first time also, you should not keep the animal for a very long time. So if, if, um, 
if you're planning to have a task that lasts, let's say, one hour, uh, the very first time uh, you shouldn't keep the animal more than 10 minutes and then release the animal. So the, the goal here is to minimize the creation of aversive associations. Um, it would be impossible to completely uh, avoid that uh, because animals just they don't like to get to be head restrained. But you, you can, all these tricks like the two pins, the short durations at the beginning, the habituation systems, these are all um, strategies that we came up with to minimize uh, this, uh, the formation of aversive associations at the beginning. Um, there's another point that I would like to discuss related to the head plate um, that is something that you might want to consider, not necessarily a problem. Um, yeah, sorry, here I was supposed to show you again the, um, the, the railing, the narrow railings, but uh, I discussed, uh, I, I talked about that before as well. Uh, so I wanted to, um, uh, to discuss something about the tilt of the head post. Um, in our experiments, for example, we had to implant the uh, hapos with a tilt because we were looking at a specific hemisphere and we were looking at the visual cortex of these animals. Um, and so the, um, the hapos uh, in, um, in the setup needs to be level, meaning it has to be uh, parallel to the horizontal meridian if you want. Uh, but if the hapos has been um, attached with a tilt to the skull of the animal, uh, this will cause um, a tilt in the eye that in the line that, co that, that connect the, the, the two eyes. So initially we thought this could have been a problem, um, but uh, the tilt was so small that we actually figure out that we, we could deal with that. Um, but it's something that you should consider in your experiments, whether, for example, you're looking at, at the auditory cortex, which is very lateral or um, very anterior or posterior regions. It's something that you need to keep in mind uh, at the very um, at the very beginning when you design your experiments. Another problem uh, that might be related to a significant tilt um, is that um, if you are using a system where mice need to um, use their front paws uh, to um, operate some device, then the distance of left and right paws to this device might be different, which can cause uh, uh, motor uh, related problems. So the execution of the movements uh, might be impaired in different ways uh, for left uh, for the left and right paw. So just something to keep in mind. So next, I would like to um, talk about um, a typical day for a mouse that uh, has uh, has been habituated uh, to the system um, that is going through uh, sort of advanced phases of training. Um, the way it works for us is that. Um, we have sessions that last about 30 minutes. Uh, we use uh, two alternative force choice discrimination tasks. So we need to control exactly when the animals can go in and out and when they can get water. If we, if we give animals free access, so start the training whenever they want and stop whenever they want, what they would do, they will go in and out in these cages, um, perform a chance level, even without caring at all about um, stimuli that we show on the screen uh, and uh, just get a um, decent amount of, of water just operating at chance level and so they will just go in and out and uh, get a little bit of water now and then and overall through the 24 hours they're going to be uh, receiving enough water for the day so um, for the task to be successful we need to say uh, we need to control exactly when the animals can go in when they can get the water and if they don't perform above uh, a threshold level that we have predetermined, then they're going to be thirsty. This is the, the only way, essentially, you can motivate animals to engage in, in the task for, uh, for the tasks uh, that I, I will describe in a minute. So the typical schedule uh, during, during the day is that uh, our technician in the morning will come in and would put in the racks, uh, the day group. So it's a bunch of uh, cages that she, that she puts in a rack. And um, around 10 a.m., uh, the first group um, uh, will get into the setup. As, as, as you saw before, every setup is connected to two cages. So cage one would open the door and the animal can go into the setup and will do the task, as I mentioned before, about uh, 30 minutes duration. And then we have an interval of about two hours. This is a very generous interval. 
uh, for the animals uh, to finish the task and go back to their home cage. And only after two hours, uh, we'll give access to the mouse in the second cage uh, to the setup. Now, uh, two hours, as I mentioned before, is, is very generous. You, you, can, you, can, you can reduce this. Um, only at the very beginning, you, you might be concerned about animals spending a lot of time in the setup itself. So it actually happened that uh, mice entered the setup and then they decide to sleep in the setup. Uh, at the very beginning, they, they don't understand very, very well what the setup is about. Uh, so they will bring uh, some, some things from their home cage and start to make that their, their home. Uh, so the software, uh, we spent a lot of time actually with if and or statements, conditional statements, so that we will not trap animals that decide to sleep inside the setup. But this, would, this behavior will disappear very quickly. So we have the, the day group. Uh, where we, um, we, we give uh, two sessions per cage during the day. And, and then uh, before going home uh, around uh, six o'clock, the technician is replacing the whole set of cages with the night group. And then during the night, we have the same procedure uh, for cage three and four, uh, two sessions during the night. And um, in this way, we can, we can train um, four animals per setup in, in 24 hours. So the, the system uh, becomes uh, high throughput very quickly because um, so one setup can train four animals in 24 hours. So we, we run two sessions per animal. So this is about a, a thousand trials that we have for a setup. Now we have uh, 12 setups. So 48 animals per day, uh, uh, 12,000 trials per day. And um, there's only one technician that is in charge of this. And um, she's replacing the day and night group. Um, it takes about 30 minutes, and then she's cleaning the cages. So here is a video that demonstrates, is accelerating a little bit, that demonstrates our technician um, introducing the um, a chain, uh, yeah, introducing the, the day group in the morning. Um, so she's moving the rack that is uh, hosting three setups. Uh, so three setups uh, imply like six cages. So she's moving the night group out and she's putting the day group in. Those are the racks, the uh, individually ventilated racks. And then she's putting uh, the setup, she's connecting back the setups, you know, just leaning toward the, the doors. Uh, and then she's doing that. Um, she's repeating the operation for the other uh, racks. And uh, in the end, it's gonna be uh, 24 cages for the day group and then there will be 24 for the night. Yeah. So she does that um, in the morning and then just before going home and then there's some cleaning to be done. Now, th there could be some um, the possibility to uh, optimize the schedule. As I mentioned before, two hours is very generous. If you uh, monitor very carefully uh, the average amount of time that it takes the animal to latch and then go back to the home cage, you can probably cram in another cage uh, without any problem. And another optimization that can be done is that right now we have two cages that are connected to a setup, but there's no reason why you cannot have four cages. In that case, you will need some sort of uh, tilted corridors, as you can see on the right side. Uh, but it's definitely something that we've been discussing and it's, uh, it's doable, it's definitely doable. Safety is very important. Uh, so we had to discuss with the animal unit here, uh, Rikin and the safety divisions, and we had to provide a lot of evidence that these setups are safe, uh, especially when you operate the setups at night, uh, there's nobody around. Uh, you have to show evidence that uh, there are no um, serious accidents happening in these setups. And indeed, over four years, more than 200 animals that we've been training we had only one detached head plate that uh, necessitated culling of the animal. Otherwise, um, these animals, uh, these setups have been absolutely uh, safe. One problem that we had uh, is a very interesting problem was that we had escapers. So at the very beginning, where we were designing the, the latching part. Uh, sometimes uh, in the morning, we, we will find uh, uh, one animal, for example, running around the room. And uh, I mean, nothing, no problem there. I mean, except that it might chew on cables, but um, 
they managed to escape from the setup, and we were really puzzled how, how the heck they were doing that. And so we decided to put a, an infrared camera, and we caught the escaper in the middle of the night. And we learned that actually they can tilt their head to almost like 360, 180 degrees, essentially, and uh, they could uh, find an angle to escape from the very bottom of the latching unit. Here you can see the chamber is a, is a dual chamber system. Um, or also on theater recordings. And then off, off it goes. So now we fix the problem and now there's a block so that they cannot, even if they tilt their head that way, they cannot escape. So um, how do we then go from the training to the brain recordings? So the, the way we do it is uh, through this um, unit for physiology, which is essentially a, a plexiglass tube that looks very much the same as the end stage of the main setup. It has uh, uh, narrowing railings and it has pins, two pins, uh, to uh, block the head plate. So the, the way it works when an animal uh, has been uh, trained, when the computer is telling us that, um, that the, um, uh, the, the animal is ready for brain recordings, uh, then we, um, we, we take this um, latching unit for physiology, that's the way we call it. And we position it in front of the cage, so the animal goes in as if this was the main setup. It goes through the um, restraining uh, railings and then uh, passes the two pins. And at the very end, as you can see in this inset, there are uh, two uh, screws here, the, the round circles in, in yellow, that allow us to uh, find, uh, uh, fix the head plate uh, so that we have a stability, the stability necessary for um, optical recordings, like two photon imaging, for example. So the, the, the idea is, uh, is when the animal is trained, uh, you you take the home cage, you uh, move out the, the main setup, you put in front of the opening uh, the latching unit for physiology. You don't, you leave the room, you let the animal latch, and you look through a webcam, and then when it's fully latched, uh, you go in, you screw in, you bolt in the the head plate with the with, with the fine screws so that uh, the, the head plate is completely blocked. And then you, you take this unit uh, under your um, recording system, your favorite recording system. Um, here, I'm just highlighting the, some, some parts. Uh, uh, as you can see, the animals tend to, be, to stay just in front of the, of the door, waiting for the door to open. Uh, so if you move away the main setup and you put the latch unit for physiology, and then you open the door, usually they just zoom in in through the, uh, this, unit, this, this, this tube and uh, sub-head latch. Um, so we, we have used this uh, latching unit for physiology with a two-photo microscope, with an optogenetic setup, uh, customized with a digital micrometer device for um, pattern optogenetics. We use it with a microscope for white field calcium imaging. Uh, it really depends on your favorite tool. And depending on the animal and on the experimenter a little bit, uh, it will typically take um, uh, maybe one to five sessions to reach back peak, peak performance in the new setup. So uh, as the animal is, is latching in this unit and you move the unit under your setup, the animal will realize that the conditions are different, uh, the sounds are different, so the surrounding elements are different. And uh, some animals uh, would sort of freeze the first session, and maybe the second session will start to re-engage with the task. Uh, there are animals that right away just engage with the task as if they were in the main setup. Uh, so it, it helps a lot uh, if you minimize the differences between the training setup and the setup uh, for the brain recordings. You have to keep everything as similar as possible. So if you're using a monitor, use exactly the same monitor at the same distance. Uh, if you have an eye tracking camera, position the eye tracking camera exactly uh, at the same uh, location, same for speakers, uh, spout, wheel adjustments. All the components should be uh, as similar as possible in the brain recording setup as it is in the behavioral uh, training setup. And um, you should also use the same software. So you, you don't want to change the timing of the task or anything. Uh, so you have to think in advance exactly what you want to uh, use during the training. It has to be the same thing that you use 
during the, the recordings. And the, the software uh, is, uh, the pipeline for, for the software is shown here in the pseudocode is, is very friendly in the sense that there is C++ code that controls all the hardware of the main setup. And then uh, you have, um, uh, you, you have um, a, a part of the code uh, where the hardware code communicates with the task code, which can be MATLAB, for example, um, where you get a, a go or a start a signal from, from the hardware co code that says, okay, now you take over and your, your training session starts. So you, you do whatever you want uh, in terms of visual stimuli, auditory stimuli, rewards, and so on. And then when the session is finished, your code is gonna get a stop. Is gonna send a stop signal, or if you want a, 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 a start again signal to the to the software that controls the hardware, which is now is gonna release the animal, let the animal go back, uh, check all the infrared beams, all the doors, and so forth and so on. Um, so it, it is the, the the code is very flexible. Essentially, you can put whatever um, um, you, you can interface the C plus plus code that controls the the, the hardware with your uh, task software very easily. So I would like to go very quickly through some example now of applications, um, how we've been using uh, this setup. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we're interested in uh, visual perception and perception decision making. Uh, so we use uh, the setups to train mice in visual tasks. Um, an example of a very complex task that um, we managed to, to use in mice is an invariant orientation discrimination task where we show mice uh, two gradings with uh, different distances, orientation distances from vertical, and the animal has to say uh, which of the two stimuli is closer to vertical, although none of them uh, is actually vertical. So it's a relative uh, measurement uh, that they need to make. And here's an example uh, of the animal actually doing the task. So you see the animal on the right side. You also see a, a black cone uh, that is shielding a microscope from the light of the monitor. And um, now you see the two stimuli, and the animal is moving the wheel that is in close loop with the stimuli, uh, making a choice of which of the two is the most vertical stimulus, and putting that to the middle of the screen uh, to get a water reward. The next one is a very difficult stimulus. I think the right one is more vertical, and the animal puts that one to the middle to get water reward. So um, we have a number of studies that are coming out. You, we put them already in the bioarchive. Uh, hopefully the, the be published soon. And um, so, for example, in this in this study, we were um, uh, looking at the natural input space for this task, which is two dimensional with the left and right stimulus orientations, and then looking at, at the probability uh, of a right choice in this space. And we could compute things like uh, probability gradients, and from that we could infer um, an orientation uh, discrimination sensitivity for, for mice, which we um, computed uh, could go um, as fine as six degrees. And uh, we haven't tried uh, finer uh, um, orientation differences uh, in our stimuli. So it's possible that mice could, could do even better than that, which is pretty surprising when you think that these are typically considered uh, nocturnal animals that are almost blind. Um, using a probabilistic choice model, we could then try to dissect the specific strategies that mice use in this task. And uh, we leveraged tremendously on the high throughput capabilities of our system because we need a, for every single bin in these plots, you need a lot of trials. And we, for this study, we used 40 animals with 1.3 million trials. That's what gave us the possibility to get enough statistical power to trust some of these uh, conclusions that we made in these studies. In um, other studies, we look at with a microscope at um, GCAM signals from uh, different parts of the dorsal posterior uh, cortex, including the parietal cortex. And in this specific study by Orlandi, um, we look we use local NMF tensor decomposition to find evidence of choice information distributed across these networks, uh, particularly um, in the ventral strain. Um, we use the setup also for um, simultaneous two photon imaging and pattern optogenetics. Uh, here we were using a DMD to control the probability of excitation of a single cell. You can see the, the green arrow indicating the cells that we stimulated, that we targeted with the digital microvirus device. And we could calculate um, 
the probability of excitation that is very confined in, in the volume in X, Y, and Z around the target cell. Um, you, you can combine these setups with uh, the blood cut, for example, for eye tracking. Here is an example. We, we're very interested in pupil dilation as a, um, as, a, as a biomarker of the arousal state of the animal. And we've been using the, the wheel, as I've shown you before, uh, um, for, uh, to look at the left-right choice of the animal. Uh, this, this system has been adopted uh, from work done at UCL uh, by, um, in the Carandini lab. And uh, you can actually find details of how to um, set up a system with this wheel. There's no voluntary head fixation there, uh, but there, there are instructions in this link by uh, the International Brain Laboratory on how to set up a, a, a system with, with this wheel for visual discrimination tasks. If you're interested, I highly recommend that you, you, you check it out. The wheel is, is very interesting for us because it's an analog signal. So um, you can look at uh, left choice time, but also this, the velocity or the acceleration of the wheel. And you can, uh, you can see um, changes of mind, if you want, where the animal goes one side and it changes its mind and goes the other side. And um, a PhD student has also tried to use an alternative method uh, replacing the wheel with just a touch pad with some stickers and use deep pop cut in, in real time closed loop. Uh, so you don't have any mechanical device or any electronics. You can just use uh, a video to uh, see whether the animal is going for a left or right choice and just need to touch some stickers on a board essentially. This is very easy to customize also. Um, so if you want to introduce a bailout choice, uh, this will the B letter here, it will be very easy to do. Uh, finally, um, if you're um, interested in virtual reality, uh, you can use the, uh, the choice ball that was described by Adam Capex. So you can put essentially a ping pong ball suspended on air instead of the toy wheel. And uh, that would allow um, the animal to um, navigate in virtual environments. There will not be locomotion, uh, but there will be virtual reality and navigation. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, yeah, sorry, here, just showing an, an example of uh, how you could replace the wheel, um, where I would like to just make a, a few comments uh, on how um, these setups would allow you to uh, use the automation and the web-based accessibility for domestic and international collaborations. So we use our setup in, in our lab, but ideally, I think uh, you, you might want to use uh, these setups uh, in, in the core behavioral uh, training facility of your center or your department. We have 12 setups. It would be great, for example, if your training, if your animal facility could host 30 setups. And then um, uh, a few of them would have custom hardware. Some labs might be interested in vision, other in auditory tasks and so forth. It will be all web uh, operated. So there will be an interface to say um, what task you want to implement. And you can change it on the fly. Uh, you can change the schedules, the data format, and um, you collect the data from, from the cloud. And uh, once the animals are trained, uh, you just have a within center delivery system of the trained animals, and you can then start operating um, your brain recordings, essentially. And there's nothing to, um, to limit this vision from a single uh, center or department to a multi-center sort of view. So the, the big vision that I would have is that there are distributed facilities across centers domestically and internationally that will help improve the reproducibility across studies it will create a lar large amount of shareable data behavioral data and you could also have a cross centers delivery of trained animal in case you want to use that trained animals also for brain recordings and anecdotally i i tested one uh, one one of these models uh, with a german collaborators who was interested in uh, trying some uh, uh, behavioral tasks and we operated everything. We essentially rented out space to our collaborator. And he tried a, a few tasks until he found a successful paradigm that then he implemented in, in his own center. So he, he, we have a proof of concept that it can work. OK, so use this setup for your lab, but consider it also as a means to boost intra and extramural collaborative research. So this brings me to the end with the acknowledgment. And thank you very much for your attention. All right. So. Our first question here is, uh, how long before animals forget their training? 
Uh, well, this is uh, very variable, depends on uh, how difficult the task is. Uh, we definitely notice some variability across weekends. If we don't train during the weekend, uh, we notice the performance goes down on Monday. Um, but um, the the short the short answer is that we don't know because we we, we are we never tried to uh, let the animal forget essentially the task. Um, I would assume that uh, if the task is very complex, after one week, um, you might need to extensively retrain the the animal. But again, we haven't tried. Okay, awesome. Uh, we've got another question here. What is the percentage of animals that cannot habituate to the head fixation system? Well, um, I have to say that um, they in our in our hands uh, they could all of them they could uh, habituate uh, the problems uh, were um, at the level of learning uh, perception to, to solve the perceptual task but they all um, could uh, learn to latch and uh, also to operate the wheel that was another uh, big achievement uh, we haven't had animals that had to be removed from the setups because they they wouldn't latch or they wouldn't um, reach the spout and uh, and drink water from the spout. So, in our hands, is hundred percent. I would say that they 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 can habituate. Yeah. Okay, great. We've got another question here. Um, how long does it take for a new mouse to achieve acceptable performance? It's it's really. Um, uh, it really depends on the task. Um, for the task, just to give you an idea, for the task that I show here, the orientation discrimination task with uh, the relative comparison, um, it, it could take up to three months actually for a mouse to learn that task. And I have to say for that specific task, not all of them learned. Um, I would say around 40% of the mice that we train could learn uh, that ta that pretty complex task. Okay, um, we've got another question here. Uh, can you use the system for virtual reality studies in mice? So I know you mentioned that a little bit. If you could expand. Uh, yes. Um, so this is uh, this is something that um, a, a collaborator is uh, is very interested in and. Uh, I think uh, some data will come up very soon um, with uh, not only a proof of concept, but actually uh, um, actual um, an, an actual behavior um, related again not to um, uh, um, locomotion, but um, a, a visual task with virtual navigation. And the modification of the setup was uh, fairly minimal. I have to say that um, in this case. The setup does not uh, feature voluntary head fixation, uh, but uh, it has the same geometry that I presented here. Okay. All right. Um, another question here is, um, well, this person has said, interesting system. I can see the potential animal welfare advantages of voluntary engagement, lack of handling, frequent weighing, etc. Do you have any hard comparative data to show animal welfare is improved versus traditional systems and practices? This is an interesting point. Um, I have to say that um, our goal was not specifically on Im improving the, the welfare of the animals. Um, uh, as much as um, as explaining the motivational slides, uh, uh, improve the efficiency uh, in the training. Um, uh, from the point of view of the welfare, uh, we we have definitely um, uh, sort of fulfilled all the requirements of uh, of our animal facility and uh, uh, in terms of uh, health and uh, well being of the animals. Um, so I, I would say that we can definitely um, uh, reach the standards that are required by uh, general uh, protocols, I would say. Uh, but it was not really one of, of our um, goals to improve on the welfare itself. Okay. I don't know if this an answers the question. It does. Yeah. Thank you.
Uh, this next question is, can you house your animals in groups once implanted with the head bar? Yes, um, uh, we have tried that. Uh, it's, it's best if you use litter mates. Um, it, it would um, it will minimize the possibility that they start fighting each other and, and um, sort of hurt each other because of the uh, with with the um, aggravated aggravating point that they have these these head plates in in their head. But definitely you can do that. Um, we're not tracking individual animals, so eventually when you uh, want them to uh, go into the setup, the way uh, we have designed currently the system is such that you need to um, individually um, house your your mice in uh, in the cage. Okay, that makes sense. All right, and then just in the interest of time, I think this is going to be our last question. Um, but this question is, how long can the animal stay in the self-head fixation system? Um, you need you need to um, um, habituate the animals to the duration that you're interested in. We we we've never tried uh, more than a couple of hours. Um, I would say that uh, on average one hour is uh, as long as we've been trying. And the main reason is that they, uh, at some point, they fell asleep. Um, they completely <laughs> disengage from whatever task uh, we, we have at hand. Uh, that's the main reason. But if you have a specific task uh, that mm, might keep them awake and engaged for more than that, uh, there, there's no limit uh, from the point of view of the setup and the, and the software. Okay, fantastic. Well, I just wanted to um, thank you again for being here for your fantastic insights today. I hope you had fun. Yes, so thank you very much. Thank you for hosting me.